Well, welcome. How's everybody doing today? Merry Christmas. Glad that you're here with us today. Um, just a quick reminder, we have a special Christmas Eve service coming uh, this Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock, and so we would invite everybody to come be a part of that with us. Today, we're going to be concluding our series we've been doing this month called Carols, and we're going to end with the song that you just hear, heard, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Now, I love that song. That's probably one of the coolest ones. Now, I don't know if many of you know, but it was actually written around the 8th century, and so it's one of those songs that has stood the test of time. Now, like we've been doing with the entire series, the purpose today is to take a song that all of us know and that all of us hear pretty consistently and, and find God's truth inside of that so that every time you hear it from this point forward, it ministers to you. You hear the message behind that. Like last week when we talked about a way in a manger, we talked about the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. I pray that every time you hear that song, you ask yourself, is he Lord in my, is there areas of my life where he's not Lord? And what does that mean when I call him Lord? So this morning we're going to be doing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Now, the word Emmanuel literally means God with us. How many of you have ever asked God to be with you, right? You ever pray, God, be with me? Like when you're traveling, if some of you are going to be traveling for the holidays and you're taking the kids in the car, you pray, God, be with me so I don't have to kill them, right? <laughs> Just be in this car. Be your, let your presence be here so I don't have to beat my kids. No, don't do that. It's a bad idea. Or how about this? Your last-minute Christmas shopping, you know, and so you decide the dumbest thing you've ever done in your life, but you're going to go to Walmart, on the 24th, because you've still got to get that one gift, and you pull into the parking lot, and you're like, oh, God, be with me and help me find a parking spot. <laughs> and he just laughs at you. <laughs> He's like, I, I wouldn't go there on the 24th. <laughs> and I can park this. Anyway, some of you might be like, oh, God, be with me as I go on this blind date, and please don't let him be a psycho. <laughs> right? Or maybe some of you who are just getting out of school, you're like, oh, God, be with me as I take this final. And the truth is, he will be with you, but he would be with you even more if you would have studied. So, what does it mean when we say, God be with us? Turn in your Bibles real quick to Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Give you a moment to turn there. If you didn't bring your Bible today, that's fine. You can just follow along on the screen. I don't know if you should put that up right away, because like, it takes it away, right? People start reading it, and I don't know, whatever. Everything's a little different today because they're using my table, so I'm back to a music stand. It's been a while since I've used one, of these, but we'll make it work. It's all good. All right, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. It says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Now pause for a minute, because what's happening here is this announcement's coming that Jesus is coming to the earth, right? And it says all of this is to fulfill what the prophet, the prophet they're referring to is the prophet Isaiah, who 700 years before this event is taking place, prophesied that a savior would come. 700 years, seven centuries before, there was a promise. Why? Why is this such a big deal? It goes on to say this. It says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, here's, here's the question. Why is there such anticipation for this? Why is this such a big deal? Here's what you need to understand. In those days, the idea of God being with you was a foreign concept. I mean, people can remember or heard stories of when God was with Moses on the mountain, and the Bible says that he passed before Moses, and he told Moses, I can't reveal my total self to you because no one can fully look on God and live. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass by, and you're, you can look at me from the side. Right, The people of that day understood that being in the presence of God was something completely different like when their priests would go into the high place to the holy of holies and if they weren't right with God or if they weren't prepared to go into that place with God they actually would tie a rope around their ankle because if they went into the presence of God and they weren't right with him they would fall instantly dead and they would need to drag their body out. 
See, God had always been somebody who dwelt on mountains and in sacred places. And now there's this idea that God is coming to be with us. That he who was distant is now coming close. And church, you've got to understand, all of creation had been longing for this time. All of creation had been in anticipation of this. It started all the way back in a garden. When man and woman committed the greatest high treason sided with the Lord's arch enemy, and this rebellion began. And all throughout Scripture, we see types and pictures of this promise. We see Moses. Moses comes onto the scene and delivers people from the land of Egypt, but he did not have the ability to deliver them from their sin. David came and established a kingdom, but his kingdom had a beginning and an end. We were still waiting for the king who would come, who had no beginning or no end who would establish his kingdom once and for all. The promises had been there, but the, uh, the fulfillment of those promises had yet to take place. And I don't know if you know this, but from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New was a period of 400 years. And in those 400 years, there's no record that God spoke during that time. For 400 years, God had been silent. And now, the announcement that all of creation had been waiting for was being made. That soon the virgin will give birth and you will call him Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. And his name will be Emmanuel, which means God is now with us. If, there, if this was a movie, this would be the crescendo of the whole thing. This would be when the music builds. This would be the excitement of it all. This is exactly what was spoken of in John 1.1, where it said this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you skip to verse 14, it says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, there was these promises that he would come. And the reason he had to come was the truth was, even though he sent his messengers and his prophets, we still weren't able to grasp. Man would, would, would make some right decisions and move in the right direction, and little by little they would go back towards the way that they once were before. And God knew the only way we would ever be able to bridge that gap was for he himself to come down, to strip himself of all his glory, and to make himself fully God and fully man. And that's exactly what he did. And that's what this song celebrates is that God is no longer a God that's a distant way off that we hope we can reach, but he's a God that's with us. This is the best news the world would ever hear. And the problem today is this. There's simply many people who don't believe this. Look, you might be in this room today and you're like, this is a story that sounds good, but I don't really buy this. Fair enough. I'm just glad you're here. Can I be honest? I'm thankful that you chose to worship with us this morning. There might be some of you in this place. You're not really sure if God is real because you don't get the tinkles like you used to. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody, anybody ever? You, come on. We're, we're AG, right? Assembly of God, right? I mean, that's what we're known for is the woo you know, kind of stuff. Right? And some of you are like, ah, I just don't feel it anymore. It just feels like God's not, even, God's not even doing what he used to do. Let me grow you up for a minute. If the only time you loved your spouse was when you had the woo feeling, you would have quite a fickle relationship. Understand what I'm saying? Because how many know you might love that person next to you, but not every day you wake up, you're going, woo, I'm so happy I'm married today. In fact, some of you are like, God, why? Okay? Here's the truth of the matter, church. God's not looking for people to love him just because they get the feeling. He wants you to love him because of who he is and what his word says, whether you feel it or not. Because that's true love. Okay? You might be young and into a romantic relationship. Oh, every time I'm with him, I just... That's going to fade. Can, can, honest right? Some of my older people in here, you can amen that 10 times over. But what doesn't fade is the truth and the foundation that that love was built on. Feelings might have got you there, but they're not supposed to keep you there. 
truth and commitment is what keeps you there. And so if you're in this place and you're not really sure God is real because you don't have the feelings anymore, maybe it's time to move off the feelings and move into truth. Okay? Because it's time to grow up a little bit. All right, that was not, not, we'll, we'll move on. So some of you, maybe you're in a really tough spot right now. And it's hard to feel that God is close. You're in it. Look, Christmas is the great magnifier. Amen? Like Christmas is the time when family, oh, I just love family. And it's just like, oh, we just do these sappy, sentimental things. You sit by the fire and watch the Christmas lights. And Christmas can be amazing family time. But when things are bad, Christmas can also be the great magnifier of the pain and the hurt and the loneliness that's going on in your life right now. And so for that reason, it might feel as if God is not close to you. Some of you in this room, you might think you're, you've done something so bad, so wrong. Why would God want to be with you? Why would God want to be close to somebody like you? And I'm just here to let you know, you're not that good of a sinner to sin so much that God would pull back from you. In fact, the reality of the situation is this, church, and I hope you hear this today. God has always been with you. When you were in right with him and when you were not in the right place with him, he's always been with you. Because the only way for you to come from where you are to where you're at now, he had to be a part of that process. You didn't have enough ability to climb out of your pit. He jumped in your pit, wrapped his arms around you, and picked you up out of it. See, because he's always with you. That's who God is. He's a God, the Bible says, who is with us. Here's my goal today. Before we're through with this message, I want every person in this room to understand without a shadow of a doubt that God is with you. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where I don't care what you did last night. I want you to know God is with you. God is, God was, and God will always be with you because he is Emmanuel, God with us. So the first point we're going to put today is this, God is with you. Luke 1.28 says this, The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Why? Why did he come to Mary? Why was that the first announcement that he gave to Mary? Because here's the truth. God was about to ask Mary to do something that was huge and that was going to be extremely difficult. And she needed to know above anything else that he was going to be with her. See, some of you right now, you're walking through some of the darkest places in your life. You're in one of the deepest, darkest places that you've ever been. And I pray that this morning you hear these words, God is with you. He may not change your circumstances. He may not change your situation, but he'll be with you. And sometimes when you know that, it's enough to keep going through. Right? Sometimes as long as I know that he's with me. As long as I know that he hasn't left me here, I'm going to make it. So the first truth that the angel spoke to Mary was, listen, God's with you. You need to know something above anything else. God is with you. Because when it gets hard and when it gets tough and when it gets difficult, remember the words that I'm speaking to you right now. Some of you... In this place, you're going through a hard time. And I'll tell you this. The Bible says that he's a comforter to us, okay? I translated that word from the Greek. Here's what comforter means in the Greek. It's a word called parakletos, okay? Para means alongside. Kletos means called to you. Do you understand what that means? Essentially, our God comes alongside of you and is called to minister to you in times of trouble. That's what the word means, that he is called to come alongside of you and minister you in your times of trouble. How incredible is that? That the God of the universe makes it his responsibility to come alongside you in times of difficulty and trouble and hardship. You ever have a time in your life when you were scared? Right? Any, anybody ever have a time in your life when you're like scared of something? But somebody came with you and it made it all better. How many of y'all remember when I told you I was scared of birds? 
Some do. Some don't. Deal with it. You're not going to hear the story. But I am, all right? It, it was trauma from a little kid. Chicken, my grandma and grandpa had chickens, okay? And chickens are evil. And they, they, they are all full of Satan. However, and I, would, I didn't get close to the chickens because... You know, they've got wings and beaks and claws and demons, right? So you don't go near evil things. But when Grandpa went with me, I had no problem going to the chicken coop. You know why? Because Grandpa was six foot four, and he had a size 14 shoe. And if a chicken got near us, all you saw was feathers and clucking, right? He'd pump that sucker across the yard. I had no fear going with grandpa to the chicken coop. I wasn't scared then. If I was by myself, pee in my pants. But with grandpa, it was all good. Why? Grandpa was with me. And grandpa was big enough to take care of that stupid chicken. I was probably big enough to take care of the chicken. It just scared me. Still kind of does. Shut up. I don't care. (laughs) Don't take pleasure in my pain. When you understand that the God of the universe, the all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God is with you, do you understand that changes everything? Just like when I would walk with my grandpa to that chicken coop and I had no fear. When you truly grasp the fact that the God of this universe is willing to be with you, to walk with you in every circumstance, every situation of your life, when we truly grasp that, it absolutely will change everything. If, you, if you're lost and you don't know where to go, the Bible says he'll be with you. He'll be your guide. When you're hurting and you feel alone, according to Scripture, he's closer to you than a friend. When you're in the midst of a trial, he is your comforter. If you are sick, and I know there's some people in this room today that you're going through some sickness, heard a couple calls this week. If you are sick, he is your healer. Even if the manifestation of the healing hasn't made itself known yet, he's still your healer. When you're weak, he gets to be your strength. And when you're lost in sin, he's your savior. The next point I want us to make today is this. Our God is with us. Sometimes as we look at our lives, we notice it's easier to see God in the rear view mirror of our life than the front window. Understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we see him better through the rear view mirror of where he was with us than as we see when what we're moving into. But the truth is, he's with us. Sometimes it's it's a little bit like Joseph, okay? And not Mary's Joseph, but the guy in the Bible, Joseph, right? The guy who had the coat of many colors. You know who I'm talking about? The dreamer, right? The big mouth, though. He did have a big mouth. In fact, it was so big, in fact, that uh, he went to his brothers and said, hey, I have these dreams, and I'm going to do great things. And his brothers were like, you're a cocky punk. And so they beat him up, and they were going to kill him. Instead, they decided to throw him in a pit. And one of the good brothers goes, hey, instead of killing him, why don't we just put him on eBay and see what we can get for him? Right? And that's exactly what happened. Right? A good brother, instead of killing him, decided, let's just sell him into slavery and get something out of this. So they did. Sold them into slavery. Now, how many know, like, when, when, you, when God says, I'm going to be with you, right? I'm here with you. I'm going to be with you. And, and next thing you know, you're in slavery. You might be like, well, what's going on here, right? Because if, if this is you being with me, I, I, I pass, right? I'm not really into this. And then if you know how the story goes, he goes to Egypt he, to his slave master. He's faithful. Everything goes well. So well, in fact, that the, the master's wife gets a thing for him. And then accuses him because he won't be with her. She accuses him of rape. And so now he goes into prison. I'm sure there were moments in that where he was like, I'm not really sure God's with me here. Like, I think I might have messed up some. Anybody else, like, ever? I I have. Where you would just, you just want to know what you did wrong. Because why did all this stuff go wrong in your life? Just tell me what I did wrong and why this has to happen to me. Here's what Joseph didn't understand, though. That prison, oh yeah, by the way, he wouldn't sleep with her, she accused him of rape, so he gets thrown into prison. Here's what he didn't know. God was about to use his prison as a promotion ground 
to move him into the palace. Because through circumstances and events, from the prison, Joseph moved to the palace and became second in command of all of Egypt. Only the Pharaoh had more power than him. See, God was with him throughout that whole situation, and that's what you need to know. Some of you in your past, you look back there, and you're like, where was God? He was still there, and he was putting things in order, and that led you to where you're at right now. And the amazing thing is, he's not done. There's more to come. Genesis 39, 21 tells us this, and the Lord was with Joseph. Just like if we look back over the course of our life, we'll see that God was with me. God was with me when I married my wife. Look, when we first got married, she couldn't work, right? She, she, green card thing. We, we didn't have one. And you don't just get one because you move to America or you marry an American. So she couldn't work. We come home a week after we get home after renting this new apartment, right, in Denver because it's cheap there. A week after that, my boss pulls me in and says, I'm letting you go. I'm just going to downsize. I don't feel like, hey, could you have told me that before I rented the apartment? Anybody ever have a moment like that where you feel you've been forsaken, where you feel as if you got abandoned? And so I didn't know what to do. I was freaking out. So at one time in my life, I worked construction for my dad. So I went and found a construction company, and I was just going to go be a laborer, swing a sledgehammer all day, whatever it took. But I had to do something to provide. I go in to this company and I'm like, here, I just need to work. They're like, what, are you, what have you done? I've been to school for ministry and I've done construction in the past. That day I go in to be a laborer. I leave being a crew chief with my own truck, credit card, and cell phone. Right? I was like, you don't know me. <laughs> no, you seem like a good guy. I'm, you're going to be my crew chief now. See, in those situations where it feels like God's not there, where it feels like he's not present. There's times he shows up. Only God could do that. You understand what I'm saying? Only God can make those situations happen. And he's willing to do that for all of us. At the times I've stood at hospital beds, and we've been there with families, and the doctor said they, they're going to die, they cannot live. And we've prayed. And we've sought the Lord. And these people have completely recovered. God was with us. And at the same time, you stand in funerals. Even though you believed that God would do something great. And that God was going to heal them in this world. And unfortunately, it didn't happen the way we had hoped for. God is still with us. Church, when I was 18 years old, running from God. I can remember driving down the Indiana bypass in my truck, and I heard this voice speak to me, right? Not audible, but that inside voice that said, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I wasn't really sure it was God because my response didn't merit God was speaking to me because I said something like, sure, I'm not, you know, sure, don't want to do this. You can fill in the blank, but and I heard that promise. He said, look, if you'll give me your life, I'll give you something you could never even imagine if you were to try. But if you keep going the way you're going, this is all you're ever going to have. See, even when I was running from God, God was still with me. God was still reaching out to me. God was still trying to draw me. Because that's who God is. And I'm nobody special. Not because, oh, that's because you were going to be a pastor one day, and so God had to really get a hold of you. He could care less. He's already made that perfectly clear to me. If I decide I don't want to do this anymore, he'll raise up the next person to do it. That's who he is. He's got a plan. And his plan is to be close to us. There's some of you in this room today, you're what I call creasters. Okay? That's Christmas and Easter, people. You, the only time you're in church is on Christmas and Easter. The truth is this. You might have thought you just happened into this room today, but the truth is this. God's with you, and he brought you here for a purpose. I couldn't be in the place I was, I'm at today without this understanding. The last point I want you to understand today is simply this. God will be with you. Whatever your future holds, whatever things are going to look like, God is going to be with you. I want you for a minute to think of this little girl, Mary. 
This little teenage girl, imagine if she could have seen the future when the angel said, the Lord will be with you. Imagine if she could have seen that future. God will be with me when I conceive this child by the Holy Spirit. God will be with me when I tell Joseph. Some of you, it's such a pretty story, but the truth is, imagine. You're, you have a fiancé, and now you go to him and say, hey, by the way, I'm pregnant. Oh, yeah, we didn't sleep together, but at God, he made me pregnant. Right? You're like, are you serious? God will be with Joseph when an angel says in a dream, it's cool, this happened exactly the way she told you. God will be with me when we travel over 100 miles on a donkey for a census that just happened to take place at the same time we're about to give birth. And God would be with me when there was no room for her in the inn. She's about to give birth to the Son of God, and there's not even room for her to give birth. God would, give birth, God would be with me when I gave birth to the Son of God in a stable and in a manger next to farm animals. And God would be with me when I was on the run trying to save the life of my son. And God would be with me when my son was 12 years old and we left him behind at the temple accidentally. Church, can you imagine? Your only responsibility in the whole world was to take care of the Son of God and you lost him. Probably not getting into heaven on that one. God's like, I gave you my kid and you lost him? How? Yet God was with her. God would be with me when she went to a wedding feast and they ran out of wine. She called her son in and said, can you do something about this? He's like, mom, no, leave me alone. And just like any mom, do what I say. And he did. God would be with me when she watched her son be falsely accused and persecuted. And God was with her when she watched him take her son out to a hill and drive stakes into his hands and his feet and beat him. And God was with her when she watched him as he looked up to heaven and said, into my hands, I commit my spirit. It is finished. And he took his last breath. And God was with her on the first day when he laid in that grave and the entire hope of what everyone thought was going to set them free and deliver them was now dead. And God was with her on the second day when still there was yet no answer. And then God was with her on the third day when the stone was rolled away and the one who was dead now lived again. And he had once and for all defeated, the Bible said, death, hell, and the grave. God was with her. And just like God was with her, he is willing to be with you today. See, that's why he calls himself Emmanuel. God is with us. The question, though, today is this. Are you with him? Are you with him? He's made himself available to be with you. In fact, he tells us this in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, 37, and 39. It says this, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we have complete victory through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. His word says he will never leave you, nor will he ever forsake you. He will never turn his face from you. He will never walk away from you. He is for you and not against you. He is with you. But are you with him? Have you chosen to be with him? 
not just in word, not just because it's Christmas time and everybody acknowledges Jesus during Christmas time. Like we've said during this whole series, it's not about acknowledging Jesus. It's about adoring him. It's about worshiping him with your life, with your other six days of the week, not just today. It's easy to do it today. But when it matters most is when it comes from the truth of your life. Too many of us only worship him one day a week and forget he exists the rest. He's with you, but are you with him? In a minute, our worship team's going to come, and they have a human video that they've prepared today to skip with music, that they've prepared today to, ex- to help you see this and complete. That no matter what you go through, no matter how hard the circumstances and situations of life are, God will be with you.